The Celebrity Apprentice. My very first episode, I was having drama with a bloke, um, and uh, but one of the guys was uh, threatening me, like physically. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I rang one of my mates as a cop and I told him, and um, my mobile phone rings, like five minutes before the show starts, and it's this copper. And he says, mate, that bloke who lived overseas, he was living overseas when he was, he's just arrived in Australia. And oh, uh, yeah. and uh, he said, uh, he's saying so and so and everything like that. And uh, we just thought I'd better tell you. Yeah, yeah. And, just uh, before you go on. Just before I go on. <laughs> the guy who was in charge of acoustics, like, um, you know, like in charge of all the audio bugs yeah. and everything that you wear, you wear a lot of them. They're so sensitive, they pick up everything. They actually come in the room. And he said, you okay? You can hear your heartbeat. Near yeah, my heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> hey boys, before we get started, ladies and gentlemen, uh, today's episode is sponsored by Manscaped. Listen, I'm being legit here. I've been using the Lawnmower 4.0 since I first talked about it. I use it all the time. It's gun, trust me. It doesn't cut you, it doesn't graze you. I don't know how they've done it. It's got a little light on it, it's wireless, it can go in the water. It's a gun razor, trust me. But hey, it comes in packs. They got these little packages, listen, right? Ball toner, ball deodorant. You might have a giggle, but trust me, you, you, your balls need to be toned and they need to be deodorized, right? It's legit, it's a given, it's a no-brainer. Anyway, I've got a deal for you. You use code the search, 20% off, listen to this, 20% off and free shipping. Use the code the search, that's it, and tell them I sent you. Lawnmower 4.0, best ball clipper there is. You can use it any way you want, anyway, let's oge. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Search. Today's guest is one of Australia's most influential and recognizable businessmen. Born and raised in Punchbowl in Western Sydney, he embarked on a career in business, launching the company Wizard Home Loans in 1996, before eventually selling it for eight years later, selling it eight years later for 500 million. He was the host of the TV show Celebrity Apprentice Australia and the mentor. He's written numerous books and remains a strong advocate for entrepreneurs and the business community. He's none other than Mark Burris. Welcome to the podcast, brother. How are you? Hey, Spen, you all right? Yeah, good, brother. I was just on your podcast the other day. Yeah, sweet. Let's do this again. Killed it. <laughs> it was good, eh? You grew up in Punchbowl? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How'd you grow up, bro? What's Punchbowl like? Yeah, Let's man. start, but let me let, I'm going to look, bro. I'm going to tell you straight off the bat. This is going to be a very money-focused podcast, brother. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're, you're, you're a fool, like, he's up there with the best of the best. So you grew up in Punchbowl. You grew up poor? Yeah, yeah. My, my old man came to Australia when he was a kid. Yep. Um, and um, he met, met my mum, Greece. And yep. uh, he left war torn Greece when Greece was at war with his five brothers. And uh, came to Australia and uh, met my mum. Um, my mum's Irish background, and they mum taught dad how to speak English. And uh, they lived in Maroubra. But, you know, like it was too expensive for them to buy Maroubra. So yep. they bought a little house in Punchbowl in those days. Punchbowl was in the. When's this? Oh, uh, Shit, man, I've been probably about early 50s. Oh, so war torn Greece, you mean World War II, straight yeah, up? World yeah, World War II, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. after Greece, World War II, mm. there were, the Greece had a civil war. So Greeks were really? fighting Greeks. And uh, they, because half of Greece wanted to become part of the communist bloc, they wanted to be part of the Soviet Union. There was a lot of communists. Legit. Yeah, totally. And then a lot of the other Greeks, what they call the nationalists, didn't want to have anything to do with it. And, uh, Churchill did a deal with Stalin. He said, listen, uh, you can have everything above Greece, Macedonia, Albania, yeah, yeah, you, Soviet, yeah. you have all them, but you can't have Greece. And uh, uh, Stalin agreed, but a lot of Greeks were unhappy with it. So what ended up happening is a civil war. So the communists in Greece were fighting the nationalists in Greece. And uh, they went to my – I remember uh, my dad told me stories about – I went to a movie to watch this, but my dad told me stories about in his village – where he lived, um, the communists turned up. He was a, they were what a part national. of Greece is that? It's um, in a place called the, they call it Peloponnese in yep. English, but Peloponnese in Greek. But uh, it's a yeah, mountainous area um, in, in the middle of Greece. The middle, uh, yep. Yeah, and no, 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 uh, you know, no, no cows or you know, just grow food. The farmers, yep. poor farmers, and uh, the communists turn up and, and you know, they were, they were hanging people off, you know, like hanging kids, young men, that is, uh, from. My dad's balcony and stuff like that. And, Fuck uh, off. Yeah, totally. It's pretty full on. And, I didn't uh, know none of this about Greek history. Yeah, no, we never did. And yeah. uh, and but a lot of Greeks, so my vintage at least, we know about it because our parents sort of talked to us about it. And uh, and my old man's father then bought, bought the whole family by ship to Australia. 
in those days it took four months, but uh, turned on to Australia and uh, a lot of them went to four Melbourne. Four months. Four months and, and, and by oh. and, and down in the bottom, dude, like uh, right down the bottom where it stunk and, and my man still today can't get on a boat. He still gets f***ing sick if he turns up on a boat. Like, uh, yeah, but so I, they, they moved out punch bowl and uh, they bought a little house there and the punch bowl and, you know, growing up there for me was pretty good because, like, uh, I had my brother and sister, had my dad's two younger brothers live with us, mm. plus my mum's two sisters. And mum and dad, of course, and uh, we all lived in this. Well, I thought there was a big house, but in hindsight, yeah, it was yeah. a really small house. But uh, yeah. I don't know where the fuck we all sat and slept. And, <laughs> but we all just sort of hung in there together. It was pretty good. Like yeah, I yeah. got brought up by a little village, and uh, the street was cool. And uh, my my, I thought this was good. Today, I think probably think it was pretty shit. But my back fence backed onto a tip. And, um, <laughs> and, and I thought that was cool when I was, yeah, when yeah, you're young. It was pretty good. You know, it's, it's an adventure. Oh, there was rats and shit like that. And I was to sit there because my dad's youngest brother um, had a gun, a, bought me a slug gun with a rifle yeah, yeah. thing. And I used to sit there shooting rats and stuff. And uh, or me and mates in the, in the street, we'd go down and, you know, do stuff in the factories. We, there was factories behind that. And so that's when my dad worked in the factories behind that. And we'd go down to the factories and sort of sneak around the back and, you know, get on bits of cardboard and go down hills and yeah. it was pretty cool. So I, I, I think I had a pretty good upbringing in terms of my family at least, yeah, and my friends. You, so you grew up, so you grew up with little money. Yeah. How did this mind state come from very early on? What was your first job like? What was the mind state? Was it instilled to you by your parents to be smart, frugal with money? Like, Well, my mum my mom was Irish, so, like, so she was a big reader and she come from an educated family, her, her family went, Musicians, pianists, and violinists. So, mum was sort of always pushing us to study, me and my brother mm. and my sister. And uh, dad worked in a factory. He worked like seven days a week. So, dad was always uh, saying, I don't, didn't want us to be like him, you know, grow up the same, no money, and yeah. working as a labourer. So, uh, I guess they had ambitions for me and, to be, and my, my family to be. A bit different to his generation, and Dad's brothers were all the same with their kids. All my cousins were pretty much the same. I've got thirty six cousins. Hey, you know, yeah, totally. Nice. <laughs> Mo- and, and mostly boys too, because yeah. there's I don't know we throw boys. I got four sons of my own, so we both mostly throw boys yeah. in our family. And uh, a lot of Boruses roam around the joint, you know, who are my generation, and and, and you know got educated by our, our parents. Mm. So, but I didn't want to do that, and you know, I, I didn't want to go to uni. I had no fucking interest. Yeah. I mean, I was good at school. But I didn't give a shit. I was more into sport, and I just wanted to become a bricky when I left school. But Did you? my yeah. mum, she grabbed hold of me and she said, "You're coming to university. And I'm going to enrol you." And she made me enrol. She took me to university. Like I'm a 17 year old boy, like like you know, young man. And uh, my mother never did anything like that in my whole life, except for this one occasion. She said, "You're going to university. You're going to get your hair cut, and you because I had long hair. You're yeah. going to get your hair cut." And I'm going to take you to university, make sure you enrol. Mm-hmm. And she took me up to the university, made me enrol in a, in a commerce law degree. And, commerce uh, law degree. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And uh, like, I don't know. I didn't know what a lawyer was. I didn't know what commerce was. I didn't do that at school. Mm. I had no idea what the fuck was going on. And, uh, but I just did because my mum said, yep. I'll do it. And uh, I did it. And uh, I guess that's where my interest in uh, business come from. Like, she put me in the, in the right stream. Yep. Otherwise, I probably would have just stayed, you know, maybe stay as a tradie. Like all my mates yeah, did. Yeah. All my mates become tradies or uh, crooks or uh, something, you know. Like, but not many of the money wanted to. Just normal them. Sydney things. I mean, West, tradie, crook. <laughs> well, <laughs> what West, else is there? Footy or, player. <laughs> or, and footy players. Yeah, footy yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. Yeah. 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 Or, or amateur boxer. <laughs> yeah, 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 correct. That's it, yeah. So, well, 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 that's a Western Sydney thing yeah. then, especially, and. Uh, you know, you didn't think you'd be, you're going to become a lawyer. Like, you only need a lawyer if you got in trouble. Yeah. You know, like, and, and you know, I tell you funny stories. When you went, so mum takes me to the university and there's all these people standing around, and, you know, you had these little groups and there was hoppers there over here. They had like a stand. Mm. And uh, mum said, let's go over and talk to these people. And the coppers offer you a, a thing where they pay you to uh, go to university because, you know, how am I going to fund all this? You know, like, I'm going to earn some money, pay, pay my way and everything. Mm. And mum um, said, go over to the police and just go and talk to them. And, I told, and they, the guy said to me, he said, well, we'll pay you if you go to university, but you've got to come down to the, in, 
in the city somewhere. You've got to come to this place where all the young coppers go to to learn how to become policemen for an interview. And I went there for this interview, and they basically said to me, "We'll pay you, but you've got to when you're finished, you've got to be a policeman on the beat and wear a uniform, and, and like That's after it. your degree's finished, but and you've got to then become a prosecutor for the police, police prosecutor." Oh, because like, you're studying law. Yeah, and I so thought, they're recruiting. I, I thought, yeah. fuck that. Uh, there's no, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. no way. My mates have never talked to me like ever again. Yeah, yeah. like, there's no fucking way. <laughs> but I, I never forget that because they took me down to the the big uh, down the sorry hills, a big sort of um, where all the young young police were and etc. Yeah. yeah, so that that was one one. My mum thought that was a good idea because she said, well, they're going to pay you to go to university, yep, yep. and just, and you got a job when you come out, guaranteed yeah. job. And that was how my family thought. Well. Get, get some education and then get a job and then a better job than what dad's got. Yeah. And that's sort of, that was our, that was our go. That was their go. Mm. But I wouldn't have ever done anything as, uh, unless it had been my mum. Yeah. But dad didn't have that much influence on me but because he was always working. I never saw my dad much. He's always going from job you know, and after that job he go to his second job and yeah. working on the weekends and it's a, yeah, yeah, my man had a milk run. My, my dad would start work at the factory around, behind our house at seven in the morning. He finished at three in the afternoon. He used to go off after that and do a, like a second job. He was a metal polisher and polished metal for two hours. All right. He'd come home. Mum would then go to the pub. Up at, mum used to work up at the Three Swallows Hotel at Bankstown at Yaguna. Yeah. And um, she'd work there till 11 o'clock at night. Mum would come home at 11 o'clock at night. Dad would get up and he'd do a milk run from 12 to 7. Legit. Seriously. <laughs> and then on the weekends he was a fencing contractor. All right. And nailing fences up. Yeah. Because I used to have to help him. I did the milk run a few times with him, yeah. But that, that was my man, like, uh, I don't know when the fuck he slept, you know, five, six <laughs> hours sleep. Yeah. But it's just about having a better life, you know, yeah, improving yeah. your life. Yeah. And that's something you and I talked about last yeah, time. Like, yeah, 100%. You know, sometimes we fuck up, but we've got to, whatever we do, we've got to try and improve our life, mm. make it better for ourselves and everyone around us. Yeah. So you come out of, you come out with that degree, you finished that? Yep. What'd you do? Uh, I went and worked, first off, so I had a, a dual degree. So I first I finished my commerce degree yep. and then I did my law degree at night because law degree takes longer. And, um, and when I finished my commerce degree, um, I went and got a job because, you know, like... Sorry, but what kind of things does that teach you, a commerce degree? Well, you can do lots of strains, but I ended up doing accountancy. So I did accountancy in my commerce degree so I could be an accountant. Yep. And I went and got a job in an accounting firm while I did my law degree at night, finished it off. And, um, and uh, I did that for a couple of years and I ended up... Um, Taken over the firm, becoming the senior partner of the firm, and it changed his name to my name. Oh, really? It was called Aim Wales and became Boris Dad and Vince. <laughs> the, the firm still exists today. Yeah. A reasonable size firm. I did that. But then I, did, I got bored, to be honest with you. And uh, so I left that and went and joined a law firm. And, uh, and in that, that period, I, you know, I, I really enjoyed that period of, of my career. Professional career, like being a criminal a lawyer. No, I did. We had some criminals. Yeah. Um, you know, we had some quite famous ones. Yeah. Um, and uh, and and uh, but mostly banking. My area was mostly banking and um, yeah. finance law. Yeah, you know, yeah. like banking Makes law, sense. corporate law, stuff both. like that. But you, so you were telling me when I was on your podcast, you you used to um, be around Kerry Packer and that. Yeah, well, Kerry is my partner. Is he? Hmm. What's that like, bro? Like, so, how is he, bros? Well, so I, I knew James. I know yep. James. And, uh, but James is really young. He's like 30 then. And um, Kerry was probably around my age uh, that I am now. Mm. And um, James, was try- that, the Packer fan was trying to buy a business and they wanted to buy a business called Aussie Home Loans. And James, a friend of mine, and I was in Wizard at the time, and mm. he said, well, mate, we're trying to buy this business called, business called Aussie Home Loans. You know about this industry. What do we need to ask this dude to make sure he doesn't start us, you know? Mm. And um, I told him a few things, a few tricks. And um, then James just said to me, he said, mate, why don't we just buy your business? I said, well, my business for sale. And he said, well, you want to buy half? I said, yeah, okay, cool. Oh, Wizard you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Kerry, they bought half. And, um, oh, did they? Back yeah. in uh, two, um, what was it, year 2000, they, uh, 1999, they yeah. bought half my business. And then the, together we sold the business in 2004 for a huge amount of money. Yeah. But uh, – yeah, but it, being in business was really cool. Like, uh, well, so you, that, that huge amount of money is half a billion dollars. Yeah, but how how much do like how much? I know you don't want to get into specifics. Did you make like how much money did you make off that? A lot, like, a lot. Like, yeah, like, like uh, let's say one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. At least nine figures. At least, yeah. 
That's crazy, bro. Each. Yeah. Just from that little idea from those brokers, persisted through it. Hey, I'll give you some money. You just lend them out. This yeah, the next minute. Yeah, but there's some I've got to say. Like, yeah. we, we had some luck too. So, and the, and the luck is this. I mean, maybe it's not luck, but there was what, a, what I call a rising tide of liquidity in the world. So, at the time in the world, there was a lot of money around looking to be lent to Australians to buy a house. Like, the oh, okay. w- whole world was full of liquidity, what they call liquidity, money. Yep. You know, banks are printing money. You yep. know, people put money in deposit, had to go find somewhere to be lent. And uh, so, so I guess that's the luck. Um, maybe it was just, maybe it's a better way to say it's just good timing. Mm. I, I played what was in front of me. I already had expertise in the area. Yeah. I, knew, I knew the zone. That was my territory. Mm. Um, and there was one other who had already started it, and I knew I could copy him. But just, I thought I'd just do a better version of what he did. Mm-hmm. So that's sort of, to some extent, it's lucky. Um, and, you know, we got ahead of all this before the GFC hit too. So, you know, we got in and out before the GFC hit. Yeah. If we had waited to the GFC, it might have been a drama. Mm. It would have been a drama for sure. So, luck and timing is so much, eh? Oh, fuck yeah. It's like how I was saying on your podcast, timing. luck and timing. I mean, you've, got, you've got to have luck, timing, and yeah. you've got to have will. Yeah. And you've got to have the, the ability work, to do yeah. it. You know, like, you've got to enjoy it. Like, I may not. I'd love lending money to people, mortgages, people who couldn't normally borrow money. Yeah. Poor bastards. I know what it was like because, you know, I grew up with nothing and I knew how it was to borrow dough. And so for me, the, the best thing in my life was about to lend money to people to go and buy a house. Yeah. You know, like I was feeling so good about that. Like it was, that drove me hard, you know. Yeah. So a combination of factors, but Kerry was fucking unbelievable. He was so good to me. Like uh, he was a big dog. That's fine. I let him be the yeah. big dog, you know. Like I'm not challenge factor. Yeah, but he was a big dog, but at the same time, he was re- always really generous with his ideas and views, and you know, he made lots of mistakes in his life. He was happy to distill what he learned out of those mistakes. Tell you that one thing that he'd learned over twenty, thirty oh. years. I just I didn't have to do the twenty, thirty years. I just made sure I just didn't. I just did that one thing that worked. Yeah. And he would share that with him because I was his partner. Mm. So he wanted me to succeed so he could succeed. Where were you staying, like, at this time? Melbourne? Yeah, Sydney. Sydney yeah, yeah. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I lived in Sydney. Yeah. And, uh, and he wasn't ever well. Like, he was always sick. We became pretty good friends. Like, you know, he'd ring me up because he hated the roosters and, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I hated South. Still do. <laughs> And um, I don't really hate them, but you know. Oh, you go for the Roosters? Yeah, yeah. I'm on the boy Roosters. That's my yeah. team too, yeah. Yeah, I'm on the boy Roosters. I've yeah. been there now for a while now. And yeah. Kerry sort of would like us one stage, but then he started hating us. And he'd ring me up and say, where are the Roosters playing this weekend? Every second we're going to home game. And he'd say, uh, come pick me up. And I'd go and pick him up. And he used to have all these rot wheelers in his house for security. Yeah. And I'd drive down his drive like the big guy. Man. Oh, you're staying in Bellevue Hill? Yeah, he was. He, he was, he's yeah, joined, yeah, yeah. yeah he's, and, um, and I drive in and, uh, you know, he's got security guards living there and all this shit. But these dogs, I drive my car there to his back door and he had some steps at the back door and the dogs would be surrounding my car yeah. and he'd say, come on, get out. And I'd say, I'm fucking getting out. Get, get rid of the dogs. He'd say, get out. Come on, walk. He'll be right. He'll be right. I'd say, I'm not getting out. I wouldn't get out. Yeah. And I'd have my, my, my passenger window wound down about that much so I could talk to him like that. Yeah, and yeah. the dogs would be just standing there gnarling at me. Yeah. I'd say, mate, get rid of the dogs. Like, you know, like it's fucking frightening shit out of me because they're, they're, they're big, mean looking yeah, dogs, yeah, those yeah. right wheelers. And yeah. a security dude would come and take the dogs away. And he used to have a female dog that he kept next to him all the time. And uh, I remember one time, because he, he only ate. Mixed grill. He didn't eat vegetables or fish or nothing like that. Fruit. No way. No, I'm serious, dude. Mixed grill. That's really a mixed grill. That sounds lovely. And uh, you know, <laughs> e- eggs, Some dips. chops, you know, a bit of steak, yeah, bacon, yeah, yeah. Uh, liver, whatever. And you go there and you go to his butt, like you know, like get Mark some food. And of course, I get the mixed grill. And um, I remember one time he's sitting opposite me, and his dog was sitting on his side. That his female dog, and that was his favourite one. And the others were all put away, but she'd all be in the house with him. And he said to me. Uh, uh, I eat up, and I, I look at the dogs just staring at me, and I, I sort of said to him, "My legs are part of look, you know, he's sitting." But yeah, yeah. The fucking dog came. She walked up, and she just put her head right between my legs, oh, and yeah, fucking just, dirty rot wheel, like <laughs> fucking staring at me. And I got the food sitting over here, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I'm thinking, should I food? Should bite me or something? <laughs> and I'm thinking, I, I don't want to move because I worry the dog might bite me on the nuts or something. Yeah. You know, like, and he was sitting, he was sitting back. I can enjoying it so much watching yeah. me sweat and yeah. the, and, and watching like the anxiety. Thing, like, thing, what the my fuck? My nuts. <laughs> sure, sure, I do. Like you know, and uh, in the van, in the end, he called it away. He was always testing me. So yeah. when he asked me, what I was like, 
he was always sort of seeing how you would react. He loved to watch how people react. Yeah. And he was brilliant at working out how markets react, you know, mortgage markets, property markets, all sorts of markets, how they react to certain stimuli. Mm. And he did it by studying people because he was dyslexic. He didn't read. Really? No, no. So he, he, would, he studied people. And, uh, and then another thing you get is experts in. So if he wanted to know about the internet, he'd bring in the managing director of um, Microsoft to sit there with him for five hours yep. to tell him what's going on. Just give him the big spill. And the dude would turn up. Yeah. And the guy would distill to Kerry in five hours what the guy's probably been working on for <laughs> yeah, 20 years. 20 years, yeah. And Kerry had this amazing memory and he'd just take it all in, you know. And he was a great observer. Yeah. He wasn't a real talker, not much, but he was a great at asking you a question and then he'd let you download for as long as you want. Yeah. It was, it was the best education it's the luckiest thing I've ever done in my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sounds gross. It was. But how have you been through, like, obviously getting rich and being, like, living the life you've had in terms of buying, like, nice stuff, nice cars, this and that? Have you gone through phases where it was new to you and you just wanted all mad cars and big jewellery and then you got over it and now you're, you know? Yeah, no, how I, are you in that scale? I'll, I'll be honest with you, like, I was never, I never got... Caught up in it, so yeah, yeah. I didn't give a. When I drive a, I drive a Hilux. Yeah, yeah. I do. Yeah, I just drive yeah, a Hilux. Yeah, yeah. I got a dog cage. Got dogs. So I got a dog cage built on the back of it. What was Sh- there ever a point? You're like, yeah, bro, I've, like I've I'm had the cash, past, yeah. Lamborghinis, this and that. Well, I did. I, I, I went out and uh, both James Packer and I both went out and bought the very first DB nines ever to be delivered Aston to Australia. Martin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful. I still got it. Yeah, but, yeah, 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 but yeah. but I it's only got a couple of thousand k's on it because I. I found it an impractical car to drive. It was a punish, you know. Oh, really? A, you know, I'd be knock out the, the, the bottom of it all the time. It was really low to the ground, <laughs> yeah, yeah. hard to get in and out. He bought one. He's six foot five or four. He, yeah. he sold his pretty quick. Isn't that like the James Bond car? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's, it is. It's, it's, it's a James it, Bond it's car. Totally yeah, is, yeah. yeah. And I, that, that's the only real big toy I bought myself. Oh, is it? Yeah. Yeah, I bought a boat for me. me and my sons wanted a boat. I don't really yeah. care about getting on the water that much, but my boys and uh, – but I was just paying the bills you yeah. know, all the time for it. And uh, in the end, I said to the boys, you can have it. I, get, I transferred it. I gave it to the four boys. And, uh, and then next thing I found out, they fucking sold it so, um, and just split the dough. So I, <laughs> I, so I was never really uh, – toys are not a big thing for me, you know. Like, uh, and yeah. I, I, you know, I bought myself a, a cool watch yeah. when standard, I turned standard. 50 or something, you know. Jar, like, yeah. But it, was, it wasn't a big deal. It was like 20 grand or something at yeah. the time, you know. It was – you know, compared to what I could have bought, I guess. But yeah. I just don't get turned on by shit like that. Yeah. Like, I mean, I still just wear normal just, stuff, yeah, normal you know. Stuff, I yeah. just wear, you know, industry yeah. short pants and uh, – it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's very there's, – there's always definitely two extremes that people can go to when they come across money. They yeah, either yeah. go crazy like a rapper yeah, yeah. or they just like, bro, I don't care about that. They, you know, you'd rather have the money. Some people would rather have the money than have this, you know what I mean? I just find it all too di- complex. Like, I don't like going <laughs> shopping. You've got to go sh- walk, walk in the shop, <laughs> fucking you know, ch- try all this shit on. Yeah. And the internet's probably easier today, but I, 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 I just don't get sort of. Well, what you get a rolly submariner? I know. I've got a, I've got a um, or well, now I'm wearing one because this one is the um, uh, Yacht Master. Oh, but, yeah. But I, no, I bought the IWC Pilot. Yeah, big one. IWCs are mad. Because yeah. I couldn't, because, you know, I, wear, I used to wear glasses. Yeah, yeah. I don't anymore, but I, and I couldn't read my watch. So yeah. I thought, I'm going to get the big bastard yeah. so I can read it. And that was a time when you didn't walk around with your phone with a, you know, we had the time on it all the time, you know. Yeah, like yeah. now I, I don't even look at it. When a watch had a use. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so now actually, it's jewelry. Yeah, now it's jewelry. Now yeah. I actually feel naked if I don't put a watch on. I feel weird. Yeah, yeah. On, yeah. Oh, I actually yeah. love when people wear IWCs and stuff like that. So then just because everyone just, those Rolex or a Breitling, you know what I mean? But some people, they got, you know, you know what you're doing when you got IWC. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, but some of my mates, I've got mates who, who spend a mental amount of money on really? watches, like hundreds of thousands. What the fuck, you know? Some of those petite Philippe. Yeah, totally. Bro. I don't understand them. There's, there's a level I understand watch quality precision. And once it gets like 10 grand and more, I think you're just paying for the name. Yeah, there's but, Petit Philippe's that are like two hundred grand. I'm like, bro, yeah, what is it? It's easy. nothing. <laughs> yeah, but they, they, I think they do it because they, they see it as a, a way of storing money. Oh yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they buy some for two hundred thousand, but they also take the view that, or the way the markets have been going, especially during COVID, that these things go up in price, you know, and therefore it's a it's a storage they have. facility. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're right. And it's better than crypto. Yeah, you know, because <laughs> you can grab hold of it and you can you can use it. But how do you feel it. about crypto? Uh, yeah, it's a weird thing. Uh, look. 
I don't mind crypto when it's backed by something. So Tether is, you know, pegged to the US dollar. I get yep. that one. That's, yep. that's fine. Which um, one's that? Tether. Tether, yep. Um, but that's the one all the crooks use. So, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a bit, bit tricky at the moment, you know, yeah. like uh, because, you know, you – Anyway, it's a bit tricky. Yeah. Um, I, I like Ethereum. Um, I think Ethereum is good because there are the, the platform that Ethereum Ether comes off is a, a platform that um, uh, people in who buy and sell NFTs or produce NFT platforms for trading use the Ethereum platform yep. for other things. So it has other it's called white label uses. Um, yep. There are things like there are other. Um, um, token businesses, digital token businesses that have gold backing them. So I'm an oh, investor in a thing called Bullion FX, which is an Australian thing. Mm-hmm. Um, that, and these guys, for every token, they have the same amount of gold backing it so that if anything ever goes wrong, oh, there's bad, yeah. gold yeah. sitting there, real physical gold yeah. to back up its value. Mm. I, I, like how I'm, money used to be. Totally. Like how money used money to be, used, yeah. It's just to always have a government backing it yeah. or some sort of form, yeah. form of um, other sort of commodity backing commodity, it. Yeah. So I, I like them, those things. But the other ones, but just because there's a limited amount, like Bitcoin and stuff like that, I just don't quite get it. And right now it's sort of where the market is. The market doesn't get it either. And those yeah. things are copping cop or hiding, you know, at the moment. And It's way know. over my head. I, I got, I know nothing about what to invest in this and that. And I chucked a slight 20 grand on uh, HBAR, uh, hash one of them. Um, which relative to, to you, it's a watch, relative to me, it's a decent chunk, 20 grand, and it just turned into like $3,000 in a month and it's still $3,000 and I hate its guts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, crypto. but the thing is you've got the experience of it though. So, yeah. Yeah, and what it did is it made a decision for you, this yeah. is not my go. Yeah, yeah, true. And don't invest in things I don't understand. Beautiful, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, mean you, you, you understand, understand this business, what you're doing now, and all your stuff that you do on socials and yeah. everything else. You understand it, that's a good place for you to invest your time. Mm. Because time and money are the same thing. They're interchangeable. Money is just a thing I get for my time. It's just a, it's a record of the time I spent doing something, whether it's digging a ditch or, you know, for the council or whoever, or doing what you're doing now. And uh, so money is just a, is a, something that reflects what you did for mm. personal exertion. Therefore, if you're going to invest your Money, which means you're going to invest your personal exertion, you might as well just invest in things that you understand and can do well. So if someone's so a really true. good brickie, so invest your time into becoming a better brickie yeah. and, 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 you know, do more quotes and work harder and longer and then maybe employ two or three people to do two or three jobs with it and try and build your business that way. That's, that's what I've yeah. always done. I'm not a big sort of share investor and that sort of stuff because uh, I, I don't really understand. I know enough about stuff to know that I don't understand yeah. enough. Mm. And uh, so if someone said to me, you want to put money in the share market, I got a little bit there just for maybe just defensive reasons. Yeah. But I don't really do that that much. I'd rather put my money into my own ventures where I have either control or have an influence over the outcomes. Yeah. That way I know exactly what's going on. Because, you know, like I'm not the CEO of BHP, so why should I invest in BHP? How, how the fuck am I going to really know except once a year when they put their report out, mm. it could be too fucking late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't control the price of oil, which BHP makes money out, or the price of iron ore, which BHP makes money out, or whatever they make money out. But I don't control that. They globally control things. True. Got, so you have no control over, um, over your destiny with those investments. Totally. And it's not, therefore, it's dangerous. <clears throat> I think it's dangerous to invest. Well, it's not efficient, mathematically efficient. Yeah. So, and mathematically efficient to me means being able to get to the core as fast as possible. So, what is the fastest possible um, route? get to the core of those things that will either put the price value up or value down. So, what, so I therefore take the view that the fastest line for me to get to anything is things that I can control or I run. Mm-hmm. Um, and, theref- and, and or next, next in line are investing in those things that are in the same industry that I'm in. Yep. So if I'm going to invest, I might invest in a bank yep. because I understand that game. So that's the second fastest way of getting to the core of what could go right or what go wrong. Because as you said right early on, it's about making sure that I get a, a sense of where the market's going and timing to get in or get out. Yeah. So shit, there might be a problem, I better get out. Yeah. Because I, and the reason I might be a problem is I know that industry and uh, it's time for me to get out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I don't know that industry, like if I'm investing in some sort of cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, 
where you don't know anything about what's going on. You just on. do what I've done. Yeah, you, 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 <laughs> do you, you burn done. it. Yeah, that's exactly. E- easy burn it. Yeah. I'm not saying don't try these things out for fun and just to get an experience how it yeah. works, you know, open up a wallet, blah, 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 do all that sort of stuff and how to tr- maybe watch the currency fuck around a little bit. But don't put your, your lifetime savings yeah. into it. Yeah. I noticed when you used the example of a bricky, <clears throat> you said work hard, become better at it, more efficient at it, make more money, get more quotes. Then to me, the definitive thing you said is, maybe employ a few people. Yeah, yeah. Growing up where I grew up, going to school, that's something that isn't talked about enough. Starting something where people can do things for you instead of you working for someone else all the time. Do you think that is out of all, the, like a very like major thing? That yeah. is the stepping stone? Einstein once said, the most powerful force in nature is the power of compounding. What I mean by compounding is if... I can compound my, eff- my, my outcomes through the efforts of someone else. So yeah. I build a brand, call it Wizard. Mm-hmm. Um, I open up a Wizard store and start lending money. I then encourage other people to open up Wizard stores. They take 80% of the money they make, but I get 20% of what they make. But they're trading off my Wizard effort. Yeah. So I'm compounding my effort, not just by what I do, but by what others do. Yeah. So that is the most powerful way of making money is yeah. compounding your efforts whether you're a brickie or uh, you're running a mortgage business or whatever it is or even you and you you know like if you put in if spanion said this and under my masthead the spanion mm-hmm. i'm going to put five other podcasts doing five other podcasts you can't you can only do so many podcasts a day in a week if you've got five other dudes or girls putting in podcasts that are interest uh, that are interesting to your audience yep. the audience that you build five things in your territory, then that's a way of compounding your business. Are you listening? Yeah. <laughs> He's already the producer and said, are you nah, listening? You know, like, <laughs> let me tell you a story, bro. Like, I, I don't know this bloke's name. I'm spewing I don't remember his name. I didn't appreciate it enough at the time. One time I was, in, uh, I was in jail, bro, and there was a teacher who volunteered. I know this bloke was rich, and, but he didn't play the part. And he was a South African Jewish man right? About 60 years old and he'd moved to Australia, thick South African accent. And his way, he said this open, like, so he ran this type of like business. I, I think he called it Money 101, something that appealed to criminals, you know? And um, he felt like it was his way of like, I don't know, giving back or something. And he, fe- he would always say in his class, he goes, boys, they teach you in jail about drugs, about like working, about this and that. But I think it's very important for you to learn a bit how to use money and how to make money efficiently on the outside. And it's, it's equally as important for people's uh, rehabilitation as any other thing. But they don't, this is the only bloke that ever done this, right? So I'd go to these Money 101 classes and he taught me a lot of stuff like that. He said, one of the things that he stuck with me, he said, he goes, when it comes to work, hard work, fine. Everyone needs hard work at a certain point in their life. If you don't have any money, you... You work hard, put your head down, and at that point in your life, don't spend anything that doesn't need to be spent because your goal of working hard is to not have nice things. Your goal of working hard is to save up enough money to use it to one day that people can work hard for you. And he said that is the definitive thing that is going to take you from working hard your entire life to being someone in a comfortable position that can provide for their family. And, and so, so like the way I took that is he pretty much said work long enough until you can start your own business venture. In, he actually said in something that you understand, like mm. you said, and then you become the person that people work for. And once that happens, your life changes. You, the way you look at work changes. The way you look at money changes. And like, bro, no one ever teaches you that. No one teaches me that anyway. I don't know like what school, so maybe some schools teach it, but they just teach us just to get a job and work hard. And there's people out there with the best work ethics that just work for other people. And great skills. And great skills and so much potential, but just spend their entire life working day and night for someone else who's kicking back laughing that just had an idea and some investment. Does this sound like... Yeah, but... Mate, well, that, this but, man but, sound smart? Or is, but, did but, I take but, this but, right? But I think, I think it's, it's logical what you're just saying. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of people, and I think it's in our instinct, is that, we want to make as much money as we can, as fast as we can, so we can consume it. Mm. And I think it's the wrong way to go about it. I think you've got to say, if I make, if I build a business, a 
as I said earlier, that uses which the South African guy said that you know other people working for me that that compounding effect, mm. the money will come. Yep. The money will come. You don't have to do it to make the money. You do it to build the business, mm. which then will generate the money. Because as I said earlier, money is just a reflection yeah. on how efficient your business model is and how hard. And if it's just you working as a labourer, that's fine. Yep. Uh, some people are happy with that. That's good too. But if you want to be, if you want to be more than that for some reason, and some people do want to have more than that, other people just want to have a nice, quiet, you know, peaceful yeah. life. Yeah. By the way, this life is not that peaceful because you're dealing with people all the time. Yeah. But if you're prepared to deal with people all the time and complaints and you know dramas and people coming and going and all sort of stuff, if you're prepared to do all that, then the best way to make don't don't do it to make money. Do it to build a business which will then deliver you the money. So and eventually, and sometimes you don't sell the business. Like I sold the business because it was the right time to sell, and I got an approach to buy from someone to buy it. You know, and when you get approached by the world's largest company to buy your business, you know that's a tick. You know you've done something right. You know, mm-hmm. so you think ego sort of nearly pushed me to do the deal. Like I thought, fuck me, this is General Electric, the world's largest company. Oh, GE. So yeah. GE bought at the time though, the world's it's largest just company. It's them. I sold my business. Uh, that to totally, GE. Yeah, yeah. Well, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> it was written up in the Wall Street Journal page really? two, the sale. Oh, it was a big hell. deal. You know, yeah, fuck for, if nothing hell. else, it was the right time to sell to the right organization for me. And uh, but uh, so I, I think if you're but it was I never did it for the money and I was explaining to someone yesterday actually funnily enough I don't I just don't do things for money yeah. I've never have um, yeah. I do it because I enjoy building something and and I'm I'm a, I'm not and people say oh you're patient because you do it for long I'm not actually patient I'm actually impatient yeah. I do it but I do hang in there because I'm enjoying what I'm doing I I, I mean it. That doesn't True. mean it always. I mean, there are days that just shit me, you know, when I don't feel like doing it. You know, like, you know, it's like, like so I don't feel like doing this, I want to do something else. But I think about what else am I going to do anyway? What, yeah. what does something else you're going to do, mate? Going to go and sit on the beach? Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah. You'd be bored in half an hour. <laughs> True. Why would you want to go like, play golf? No, that's not my go. Yeah. I'll be bored with that too. Um, you want to go and sit in a coffee shop and play on your computer? Maybe 20 minutes worth. Uh, do you want to sit home and watch Netflix? No. Nah. Mate, I always come back to doing what You're I'm doing. You're explaining my life. You're making me feel bad. No, I'm joking. No, but it's, it's All these good, boring things. But, okay. Yeah, but th- once you do them. Yeah. And that, once you do them. No, you're 100% time, right, you, 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 You're over it, man. Yeah, like, 100%. Oh, I'm 66. Everyone says to me, well, why don't you retire? <laughs> I've got mates who've been working the whole life so they can retire. Mate, they're bored off their heads. Yeah, yeah. You know, like they're fucking playing golf and they're trying to look for someone to go and play a game of golf with and, you know, <laughs> getting excited about, you know, Chasing a golf ball around the fucking golf course, <laughs> you know, and having a ten dollar bet, and uh, you know, and then go, yeah. go and talk to the pro and make sure that you can get the pro to give you a few tips. I've always and, thought that golf thing was just like a, it's like a, a status type of thing. Like well, we play golf, like we're in that league now, and I always look at that sport. I'm like, bro, golf, go mate, out of here, mate. I did it. I, look, someone taught me to join the Australian Golf Club because I just thought, wow, that's the elite thing, you know. If I could become a member of the Australian Golf Club, yeah. and uh, and you know, I, I try. And I thought if I could just get through that, because like if you get um, banned, like one person blackballs you, you're out, okay? Oh, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I thought that would be the um, great little conquest for me, just a little Greek boy, just to get through that process. Yeah. And, you know, play from the West, so I'm not, I'm not from the East, East and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And uh, I actually did get blackballed. But, oh, no way. But Kerry was one of my um, uh, nominees, and yeah. he was alive at the time. And uh, he made sure that – I somehow got in. I got into the Australian Golf Club anyway. You know what's interesting? I never fucking played there. Oh, really? <laughs> I, I, ha- I pay the, the fees every year, for yeah, year, yeah. year after year. And during COVID, I just stopped. I thought, what the fuck am I doing this for? I've been yeah. doing it for about 15 years, paying them <laughs> shitloads of money every year. What do you but, mean you got blackballed? What, well, some what hate happens, or something? Yeah, well, I, like, I, I know what, I, I'm pretty sure. And I, <laughs> they're not allowed to tell you who the dude is that yeah. blackball you. Uh, and, but, but if one person says, I don't want him to be a member... No way. They can't One of the you. upper members yeah, votes yeah. you out. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I'm pretty sure I knew who the dude was because I had a dispute with him yeah. many years before. And, uh, but like, and, that, and I, I, my um, nominees, we call it, one was Kerry Pack, another one was a really famous barrister, like a really famous QC at the mm. time, criminal barrister, mm. a really good friend of mine. And uh, he threatened to take him to the Supreme Court, um, to the golf club of the Supreme Court, unless they – Look, re 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 looked at this, the decision. 
Oh, uh, that's it. Oh, fuck yeah. It's and, that uh, big. <laughs> oh, it's a big deal. Your barrister, mate, mate, we've we'll, we'll got a Supreme Court, you know, blackballing yeah. well, me. Well, <laughs> because you can't, you can't, like, uh, because it's, it's in, in, he would say it was inequitable. Like, it's wrong that you yeah. um, don't allow someone to join your club, um, but at the same time don't disclose who the person is or the reason why yeah. he's not let into the club. And, yeah, uh, yeah. and it was just a reason over a, a dispute I'd had with a dude, I'm pretty sure, over a dude, with a dude over there over another matter. It had nothing to do with golf, nothing to do with yeah, character, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, whatever. It was just something he didn't like about me where I got the better from him in business, you know, and, yeah, uh, yeah. and uh, he had the shits. And, um, and, again, he had the right to blackball me, but it didn't work out that well for him because in the end, uh, as I said, uh, they let me in. And, yeah. and then, then, but I only did because I wanted to become a member. And then, but the whole prospect of playing golf just didn't appeal to me. Uh, just fucking just left me just yeah, completely yeah, yeah. bored. And uh, <laughs> and I, I got mates who play there anyway. So if it's, if I really want to play bad enough, I can always go and play. You know. Yeah, the Celebrity Apprentice. What channel was that on? I remember this. Channel obviously, nine. Channel Nine. Obviously, this was about how long ago? Ten, twelve years, years ago. Ten years ago. Yeah. Ten years ago. Yeah, I remember like coming on at night, sitting in jail. How'd that come about, bro? So what is that? Remind me what you were doing. You so had- I was, I, well, this was set up by Donald Trump originally in America. So yeah. Donald Trump was the, the boss, so to speak. Oh, is this the, your fire? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember you doing it. Yeah, yeah. You used to do the fire. Yeah, yeah, your, yeah, yeah. Oh, brother, you just brought it back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And tell, then you, you bring in 10 or 12 guests, half boys, half girls usually. Yeah. And um, it started off with just the apprentice, just normal people, not, not celebrities. And we yeah. turned the celebrity apprentice to copy the American version. Yep. Yeah. And um, I effectively had to be Donald Trump, sort of had to end up eliminating everybody by firing them and end up with one person left who's the winner and that person won money or something and like and that. And you used to give them like ideas and they got to turn them into like little business Correct. little ventures. Yeah. And yeah, I remember yeah. there was like, I, I, it was I a business like clothes and there's a woman who's designing clothes and that was like, well, yeah. It was, it was, it was sort of like um, about seeing how creative they could be, yeah. how hard they would work out at, how well they worked in a team, yeah. like, you know, how, how they could pull a team together. Who would rise to the top as a leader of the team um, for whatever reason? And, uh, you know, you saw That's people smart. rise to the top who you wouldn't expect, like just yeah. sometimes younger people rose to the top. Um, a lot of times, not very rarely did the older people win these things. Most yep. it was the younger people. Um, Where were you filming these? Well, we had a studio in um, Fox Studios to start off, yep. and then we ended up having one out, out at um, Redfin there. Channel 7 had a – was a Channel 9 show, but Channel 7 had a studio. which we, At Everly A. Yeah, 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 at Everly, yeah, 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 right there. Yep. And uh, – and it was it was a bit of fun. Like I did it for um, five seasons. Oh, really? And, yeah, uh, and uh, but in 2016 we stopped doing it. Mm. Um, to be honest, I'd had enough. Um, yeah. They just started the show up again last year, and uh, they did they they originally asked me if I would do it, and I didn't want to do it. And they got another guy, an English bloke, to do it. Oh yeah. It was a, it was it was a bit of fun in the beginning. Like it was something never done before. I didn't do TV. Mm. I tell you a funny story about it. Uh, so my very first episode i was having a drama with a bloke um <laughs> that who in, it was a business drama, but he turned out to be not he turned to be be more than just a business dude right so i was asked by a big hedge fund in america to take control of an australian company that was having problems with their board and uh and you know and i i didn't know nothing about it and i just said okay whatever i'm ha- their lawyers in australia asked me to do it. they recommended i do it and i wasn't doing much it was in 2009 mm-hmm. i agreed to do it and uh, but the the dude and the board that I got that I got rid of weren't happy, and uh, and they were being accused of brought in the joint stealing money from this company, a lot of money. And in the end, they they all, they few of them got. And um and uh, but one of the guys was uh, threatening me, like physically. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I rang one of my mates as a cop, and I told him and. Um, Keep an eye on this bike because you know it's a yeah probably incredible yeah, thing. Yeah. And uh, so the very first day I was doing my show, the very first I'd never done TV. The very first day I'm so I'm sitting in the studio and I've got my own little dressing room there and they've got the makeup on me. I've got a little suit and I've got and you know audio little shit all over me, up, you know, yeah. mic'd up all over the place. And there's a light in my room, that sort of gives you a countdown of how long you got before you go on yeah. in the show. And um, I had no idea what I was doing. I'm not a clue. And uh, but again, I was just playing what was in front of me, I guess. And uh, my mobile phone rings like five minutes before the show starts. And it's this copper. And he says, mate, that bloke who lives overseas, he was oh. living overseas when he was, he's just arrived in Australia. And, uh, and uh, he said, uh, he's saying so and so and everything like that. And uh, 
We just thought I'd better tell you. Yeah, yeah. And, just uh, before you go on. Just before I go on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going, fuck. <laughs> what's this, this guy's been yeah. threatening me. My fucking heart starts racing. Yeah. And uh, the guy who was in charge of acoustics, like, um, you know, like in charge of all the audio bugs yeah. and everything that you wear, you wear a lot of them. They're so sensitive, they pick up everything. They actually come in the room. And he said, you okay? You can hear your heartbeat. Fucking hear my yeah, heartbeat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can hear my heartbeat. Yeah. My heartbeat. No, what do you say? No, I'm just nervous. I'm, I'm just sweet. You know? just sweet. I didn't tell him what the – Yeah, what yeah, just ha- Literally just happened. Like, the timing of the stuff was like fucking – like might have been two or three minutes before I was about to go on and it happened. And uh, uh, anyway, it, it was no drama. The guy ended up getting – the cop was nailed him in there because yeah, – yeah. uh, but they'd be uh, – and uh, – I saw I was a full serious dude. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 He's, I think he's still in there, but he's yeah. probably out, out next year. He yeah. got quite a big sentence. It took yeah. a long time for him to, you know, get all the evidence against him. Yeah, but, like, out. yeah, but, uh, yeah, I know. Well, I don't know if he's full serious, but you take it as serious. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, who knows? Serious. Yeah, yeah. You know, With what level of serious? Yeah, you don't know, but, but he wasn't a spinner. It wasn't a, it was, no, no, yeah, no, yeah, no. It wasn't, no. Just it wasn't a spinner. punter from just yeah, walking yeah. around the street. No, no, no. <laughs> Anyone got a phone these days, eh? Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah, yeah. But one question I was going to ask you, are you partially answered that. I think I know what your answer is going to be. You got a hundred grand. What business would you invest in? And I know that you're, what you're going to say is something that you have knowledge in. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you don't, if you're not already doing something yep. and you're just like just hanging out and you're working somewhere, you got a job. Yep. That hundred thousand um, dollars. If you say right now, right at this moment, right at this moment, um, I'd say just don't invest in anything. I'd say put your money in the bank. The reason why I'd say that is because we're in a, what they call a dysfunctional market at the moment. So you've got inflation raging, you've got low unemployment, um, which are, those two things don't normally go together. You've got growth starting, national growth starting to slip back. You've got wars and shit going on around the world. China's going backwards in terms of its own growth. The US is in a recession, a technical recession. Mm-hmm. It's what we call a dysfunctional market. In dysfunctional markets, cash is the king. Yep. Cash is the most important thing. So. I would say to you, invest in the future. And what I mean by that is leave your money in the bank now so that when in six or 12 months' time opportunities arise, you've got enough cash to go and take advantage of those opportunities. Yeah. Right now, anything that you buy, I don't care what it is, is just as likelihood of going up as it has down. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's not it's the science would say to you, the science yeah. would say to you right now, there's as much risk of losing money as there is of making money. Mm. And that's not a time to invest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, may, you invest when, there's a top, when, the, when it's the, the, the event or the proposition or the, the possibility of making money is greater than the possibility of losing yeah. money. You know what I mean? Like you don't do it when it's an even money chance. Mm. Otherwise, most of the go to the horses yeah, true, and have a bet true. or go on black, bet on black or red. Yeah. You know, like that, that. So investing is different to betting. Yeah. Investing is different to funding. Investing is about investing in something where the chance of making money is greater than the chance of losing money. Right now, the chance of making money and losing money are exactly the same, the same because the market is dysfunctional yeah. because of all the events that are occurring in the world. And we've just come out of COVID. We've got a, a whole lot of really complex economic environments that exist at the moment. And fortunately, you can, still, you can make pretty good money in the bank today. The bank interest rates are better than they have been for a long, long time. Yeah. I think the time to invest, which is a way of answering your question, is not now. Yeah. The time to invest in any asset class right now is, is, is not now. It's six months from now when we see what falls out of all this. Yeah. And what falls out of all this is opportunity. So, again, playing what's in front of you, the only thing that's in front of you right now is don't do anything. Yeah. I mean, if I'm, you know, like if... Uh, and you're even talking... Uh, maybe just things like starting up your own tree logging company, starting up your own convenience store, even those things yep, you those would put things off? as well. Oh, yeah. yep. I, I wouldn't go and rent premises, for example. All right. Because they, they all have things attached to them right now that are potentially a problem. And you don't know whether you could get something cheap. Yeah. And there's nothing worse than paying overs because mm. it's very hard to read back from there, get back from there, renegotiate your position. Yeah. So every investment, you make your money out of every investment by the price you pay on entry. It's not True. about, oh, shit, there's momentum in the market and uh, everybody's making money, so I'm going to go and buy a property because I'm yeah. everyone else is making money. It's the price you pay for the investment, the business you, you're going to build. It's the price you So that, that includes all your costs, that's rent, staff, you know, inventory, whatever it is, build your brand, 
it's the price you pay to enter, and then it's the price you pay, and then and and then what you sell it for down the track is not not something you can influence. What you can influence right now is the price you pay to enter. Yeah. So enter at the best possible price, and you and I'm not saying to you that entry price will be cheaper next year. Yeah. But I'm just saying it might be cheaper next. Might be. We don't know whether it is or where it isn't. Yeah. So right now it's a time just to hang on to your money. Unless there's a proviso, unless you're someone like you who's on a roll and, and this happens during COVID, for example, mm. you're on a roll and things are going really well. So for you, it's not so much an investment in a new business, but it's just adding to your current business. Now, yeah. I don't say don't add to your current business. I'd say if your business is on a roll, then add to your current business mm. because you get an economy of scale. Yep. It's a small investment relative to everything else. But if you're kicking off, just be careful. And don't, and don't get, think, oh, should I go and buy crypto or go and buy uh, real estate? I, I wouldn't be buying any real estate at the moment. You wouldn't? No, 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 no. I'd so wait. You get into that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd wait. Because it's something that I toss up at this exact point in time. In yeah. fact, last night I was on Domain. Not that I can afford a whole house in Sydney for like millions of dollars, but I can afford half of one. Yeah, but anyway. Yeah, well, yeah. you know what? If, if, you're trying, if you're looking at it from an investment point of view, Yep. And so if you're saying, I want to buy an apartment or a unit or a house to rent out for investment because that's just where I want to park my money, yep. um, I don't think now is the right time to do it. I think you wait for it. If you're trying to buy a house to live in for your family, yep. but that's yeah. a different issue. If you, if but the, I'm not doing that. If the lender wants to lend you the dough, you qualify, you've yep. got the deposit, you find the house that you and your family love, go for it. Go, yep. go yep. buy that. But if you're saying, oh, I just want to get into the market and get my, uh, money, an investment, yep. make a return, um, I don't think now is the time to do it. I think you should wait until... And what you're waiting for is to see what the interest rates will end up being. Because when you buy a property, assuming you've got to borrow some money, if you're borrowing money and you borrow on today's wages or income, in your case, yep. stuff you earn, um, relative to the interest rate, you might think it's affordable, but you don't know how high the interest rate's going to go between here and the end of this year or early yep. next year and how affordable it's not going to be or how yep. less affordable it'll be. Yep. So then that's a problem. And also, you don't know the fallout of where interest rates are going to go. So interest rates could put us in a recession in Australia. We're not in one, but it could put us, the whole country in a recession. Could. Yeah. If the Reserve Bank continues to force these interest rate increases down our throats. And they may do that economically. They've already made that clear yeah. that they are going to continue to increase rates. We just really? don't know how, or how much. Really? And the other thing is, it, the higher, this is a rule of thumb, because, you know, we're a money lender. We lend money. But every half a percent that the interest rates go up. So, so far they've gone up uh, 1.75%. Mm -hmm. For every half a percent that interest rates increase, we, the lenders, will lend a borrower 5% less. So if you're borrowing a million bucks before, mm -hmm. in February this year, now you've had, there's been 1.75 increases, you're going to get 17% uh, less. Oh, really? So I'm, I'm going to lend you 17% less. So I'm going to lend you 830,000. So you, are, you had a, to say, had a $200,000 deposit before yep. and you could borrow a million bucks, you could buy something for one point. Yep. You still only got a $200,000 deposit. I'm only going to lend you 830. Yeah, you so, now, yeah. so you only can spend a million and 30. Mm -hmm. So what does that say? That says buyers can pay 20, 15 to 20% less yeah. now than they could six, seven months ago. Yeah. So that tells you that the property market's falling. So if you think interest rates will continue to go down, which I'm 100% certain they will, yep. I mean go up. Go up, get yep. up. Yeah. House prices must continue to go down. Go down, yeah. So I go back to where I started from and when it comes to buying in any asset class, it's the purchase price, the price you pay. Is, it tells you how much money you end up making. It's your entry price mm. is the most important thing. So you want to try and buy, not at the bottom of the market, but you want to make sure that it doesn't keep going down after you buy yeah. when it comes to investment. So on that basis, hold off. Oh. Just wait. So when you reckon? February. I'll tell February. you why. I love this. The Reserve Bank meets 11 times a year. Yeah. The Reserve Bank determines interest rates for the whole country. So us as lenders, we get our cue, all of us get our cue from what the Reserve Bank says. The Reserve Bank meets every month of the year except for the month of January. The last meeting they have is the beginning of December. I think they'll continue to increase interest rates until that, in, up until and including the December meeting. Then they're going to wait to see what December and January, they don't have a meeting in January. The next meeting is the beginning of February, the first, February, first Tuesday in February. I think, this is my own personal view, but I've done a lot of analysis of this, I mm -hmm. think the interest rate increases between um, September, 
October, November, December. I'm, I'm backing there'll be a rate rise on every one of those months. We'll have enough effect on the economy that we'll stop spending and inflation will get more under control. The next time they get their inflation numbers after the December meeting is at the end of January. Then they meet first week of February. I think at that point they're going to say something like, you know, we've done enough with interest rates. We've gone hard and fast in mm -hmm. all of 2022. We're just going to sit back and wait. At that point, house prices will start to feel like they're going to recover a bit. Yeah. That will mark for you when is the, the lowest the lowest, the lowest, po po yeah. lowest possible time that the, and the, probably the best time to buy because at that point there'll be a lot of property in the market for sale because a lot of properties aren't selling. Yeah. So there'll yeah, be I a, heard that. Yeah, a lot of properties. Yeah. The clearance rates, they're, they're okay last week, but I follow clearance rates every week. And if you go to a thing called Core Logic, the you, clearance you, rates is the uh, amount of sales at auctions that actually that's sell. sell. Yeah. Yeah, that get put up and compared yeah. to what sells. Yeah. The clearance rates last week were pretty good, but the, but the number of properties up for sale was double. What it was a year ago, so really? so it's still not that good. Yeah, and uh, it got up to sixty five percent last week, but the week before it was only fifty two percent of everything put up for sale was, was actually sold. Yeah. So I think by the end of this year there'll be a lot of properties still not sold. People start to say, "Fuck, I've got to sell this property because for whatever the reason they decided to sell in the first place." Yeah. January, February, you know, people spend too much money at Christmas time. They've all been on holidays. Everyone's been to fucking Greece or Spain or fucking somewhere, and they're all spent too much money. They're still paying their credit card off. I reckon February next year will be the zenith point, the point where people are going to say, "Shit, I'm going to sell," and I think it's going to be at the point at which Reserve Bank might have one more rate rise in them, but might not have might have no more rate rise, or might have a pause. At which point it's time then you know exactly what your interest rate cost is going to be every month after that point because you know the rate the rate rises aren't going to occur much after that. Yeah. You know what property price are, and there'll be a shitload of stuff to choose from. Then is a good time to make an investment. Beautiful. That's very. That's very. Um. But keep looking, Spanny. Like don't yeah. don't fucking stop. Last question, bro. Who stands out in your life as the as your biggest mentor? I know, like, say you've had your, your dad. His work ethic. You've talked about Kerry Packer. Is there somebody you just like you really appreciate, really learn a lot from? Yeah. Well, I, I'm um. Uh, really interested these days especially in um i made a commitment when i turned 65 i made a commitment to my younger son is 30 um turned 30 around the time, same time that i want to be like my dad is now i want to see my my younger son when he turns 65 which means i've got to live another 30 years okay yep. and um or 35 years and that means i've got to live to 100 Okay, that sounds a bit weird, <laughs> but my old man's eighty nine, so like he and he's in good he's in good shape. So what I've been doing lately is really sort of doubling down on knowledge about how to increase your longevity and the quality of life, how to live longer, what not to have, and what you should be having. So I become really interested in people like um, the Hoopman podcast, yep. uh, Lex Friedman. Um, I've been watching, I watch the fight dietitian, um, Geordie Sullivan a lot, listen to what he's got to say about nutrition. So I'm big, I'm really big on, and it is a mentoring process for me because I'm not a scientist, but I'm really big on people who can help explain to me how and what I should be doing to live longer to live better. Not because I don't, I don't, I don't want to be, I'm not doing it, not many of these people want to yeah, yeah, but I just want to see my younger son turn the same age as I am now. You're not one of those elites that wants to live. <laughs> no, no, no. Hey. I, it's not for that reason. Yeah, I, yeah. I just want my son to enjoy what I enjoy with my dad. Yeah. So every Saturday I go and see my dad. Yeah. And uh, and I sit there, just me and dad sit in the backyard, and just talk. And we talk about. He tells me about whatever, whatever we talk about, and uh, it's cool. And I do it every week. And I and I want to be that person. Yeah. I, I want to be that person to my youngest boy as a marker. I've got three others above him, but I want to do it with all of them, but I want to do it with him, and I want to be able to see him have kids and grandkids as well. Like my dad now sees – I've got a grandson. My dad sees my grandson. He's got a great, great grandkids. And yeah. uh, I just think that's simplest, but the best thing in life is to be like my dad, you know, but I need to get like my dad – I figure I might need, I probably rough myself up a little bit more than my dad did. You know, yeah, he led yeah. a pretty simple life. I led a pretty wild life when yeah. I was in my 30s. So I just figure I got to do things to make myself really healthy. So I follow people on 
various mediums who are, who are elite scientists who just commit their lives to improving the lives of others. Cracker answer. Cracker interview, brother. Thank you very Thanks, much. Dude. Beautiful. All the best.